Welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's, our podcast, as we are looking right now at the Gospel of Mark and meeting Jesus in new ways. We are joined by Reverend Dr. E.B. Arnold um, from Candler Foundry as she is helping us give an overview of the Gospel of Mark and understanding in this particular chapter, Mark chapter 4, that we reveal uh, that Mark has Jesus as somewhat of a secret maybe a secret or actually maybe a mystery, holding himself as the mystery of the Son of God. And what does that mean for you and mean for us to deepen our understanding of the mysterious Son of God, Jesus, in holy and new ways? Let's listen in. Hello, friends, and welcome to this fourth lecture in our series on the Gospel of Mark. Today, we explore the motif of secrecy and Mark's mysterious Messiah. Throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus is famous for telling people not to let anyone know who he is, particularly not the Son of God. Today, we're going to explore why this secret exists, what it looks like, and what we as readers of Mark and as followers of Jesus, what our relationship is to this secret. Let's get started. First, demons are not allowed to tell anyone who Jesus is. This may be an odd place to start, but it's where Mark begins, oddly enough. Mark tells this story in his first chapter in verses 23 through 27. While he was there in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out. And they were all amazed. These are the people in the synagogue. And they kept on asking one another, what is this? That's very interesting. At first, we think that Jesus is just saying, be quiet, because he's had enough of the sass that this demon is giving him, right? Well, let's explore the next couple healings, the next couple exorcisms that Jesus performs, and we might see something else. It says in a few verses after this last one, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, that's very interesting It's not the content of what they're saying about other things. It's not that the demons are protesting that they're being driven out. But he won't let them speak because they know who he is. And so that lets us know Jesus is trying to keep it a secret who he is. And so we have to wonder then, why this secret? In fact, it says later in chapter 3, whenever unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, you are the son of God. But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. Interesting. Just from people who are demon possessed, just from unclean spirits, we find out that Jesus doesn't want anyone to know that he's the son of God. That's very interesting. Not even people who Jesus heals are allowed to reveal who he is. Not that that stops them much. So the first healing that Jesus does is of a leper. And the leper comes to him, begging him and kneeling in front of him. And he says, Jesus, if you choose, you can make me clean. Of course, we know that Jesus performs this healing. And after sternly warning him, he sent him away, saying to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Now we have to wonder, how could anybody keep such good news to themselves? He doesn't want people to know what the full extent of his powers are. Don't let anyone know. Say nothing to anyone. Very strange. Another healing that Jesus does in chapter 7 is of a deaf man. And he, this is the famous one where he, he puts uh, his fingers in the deaf man's ears and says, be opened. And the text says, and immediately his ears were opened. His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. Interestingly, he's not just telling the man who is healed, but even the people who are witnessing this healing. 
They are to say nothing to anyone. This is very interesting. We may think, is Jesus just being modest? Well, he's attracting huge crowds throughout the first half of Mark's gospel. And he seems very popular. It says that his fame is spreading and he heals lots of people. But why is it in particular situations he tells them not to reveal who he is as God's son? In fact, not even Jesus' own disciples are really supposed to get all the information about Jesus or speak all of this information. I love this one scene in chapter 4, verse 41, when they're on the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. And after Jesus has calmed the wind and the waves because they were threatening to swamp his boat, it says the disciples were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, this is after being Jesus' disciples for several chapters. They have already seen him do other miracles. They already understand that he is an important teacher and prophet. None of this has escaped their notice. But it's very interesting that in this moment where he flexes his power over all the natural world that's surrounding him, his disciples look at him with different eyes and say, who is this? Notice that there's either Jesus trying to camouflage who he is as the Son of God, or Mark provides us with all of these characters asking these questions. The people in the synagogue, what is going on here? Who is this? His own disciples, knowing that it's Jesus, knowing that it's this great prophet, this rabbi, still has to ask, who is this? After Jesus was transfigured, on when he goes up with his disciples and he's transfigured, the text says he, he goes through a metamorphosis where his natural appearance is somewhat stripped away and his divinity is revealed. It says that his face is shining and his clothes were white like they'd been bleached. And after this happens, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. Very interesting. They've seen Jesus in his full divinity, and he tells them not to let anyone know until after he has been ri risen from the dead. It's very interesting. It's as if there's something that happens between this point of being transfigured and another point of being raised from the dead, that there will be something that will happen that telling this thing about might compromise. And I think that a great place for us to think about in the text in order to help us understand this is the very first thing the disciples say to Jesus in Mark's gospel. Well, of course, we hear the story of him calling his disciples, and we know their names. But the first time his disciples say anything to him is when Jesus is off in the desert by himself, and he's praying. And they come, it says, hunting for him. And they said to him, everyone is searching for you which I think is a really great statement to sort of capture what's going on in Mark's gospel. Everyone is looking for Jesus. They're looking for the Son of God. And so the question is, where then do we find him? Well, the problem is, is if we call him the Son of God and we look for him in being a healer, healers, by their nature, heal. And so if we understand Jesus too soon as the Son of God, we can think that for Mark, being the Son of God means that Jesus will be a healer. Jesus is also presented as a teacher. And so we might mistake that his role as the Son of God means that he's a teacher. He draws great crowds and he instructs them. Jesus is a miracle worker. He heals and performs exorcisms. He multiplies bread and fish. He walks on water. 
The problem, though, is if we think that Son of God means miracle worker, then that's all Jesus has to do to demonstrate that he's the Son of God. So what is the demonstration of Jesus being not just a healer or a teacher or a miracle worker, but how do we know that Jesus is the Son of God? What is the corresponding action to that specific role? Well, that's very interesting because the only time in Mark's gospel that someone says Jesus is God's Son and no one tells them to be quiet. No one says, say nothing to anyone, is when Jesus is on the cross. The text in chapter 15, verses 37 through 39 tell us, Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. The son of God dies on a cross. Isn't that interesting? All those times that Jesus was expelling demons, or Jesus was working miracles, or Jesus was drawing huge crowds, and anybody was tempted to call him the son of God, he said, don't say that. Don't let anyone know. Because what really and truly defines Jesus as the Son of God for Mark is that he is crucified. And if we don't see the Son of God as crucified, we don't see him. Everyone is searching for you, Jesus, the disciples say. And Mark tells us if you want to find him, if you want to find the Son of God, you have to look on the cross. And so we might begin to wonder then, what is our role as those who follow Jesus and as those who are reading along in Mark's gospel? How are we to pursue this mystery that Jesus doesn't want to make this revelation of who he is because he's afraid that people will mistake him for being the wrong thing. They'll see him as a healer and they'll mistake that the Son of God means a healer. They'll mistake that Son of God means a teacher. And Mark is very insistent that Jesus as Son of God means he is crucified. So what, how are we in relationship to this mystery, to this cloaking, if, if you will? Well, it's very interesting because in Mark chapter 4, we get this really big drawn out parable that Jesus teaches. And parables are nothing if not a mystery at first. Jesus tells a parable of a sower. I'm sure you remember it. A sower goes out to sow. He has a bag of seed and he casts it on various types of ground. And the seed does well in some types of ground and poorly in others. And so after he's done talking about this and he tells people, what this is really about is the word of God and how some people respond to it and some people don't. And everyone is at different places in different times. But what I think is really interesting about this parable and how it shows us what the relationship is to this mysterious identity of Jesus is that Mark tells us when Jesus was alone, those who were around him along with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look but not perceive and may indeed listen but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. We think this sounds harsh, but what's really important is to focus on the beginning of this passage. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. Do you see what's happened? In this passage, Jesus has proclaimed the parable of the sower to thousands. And then later, when all the rest of the crowds go away and Jesus is alone, 
a few stay behind. A few draw closer. A few gather in. And they asked him about the parables. Hey, tell us more. Explain this. Help me see. And then he says, to you has been given the secret. That's who the secret's for, whoever is willing to pursue it. Whoever is willing to ask the questions. Whoever is willing to stay longer, to linger, to think. And I think this is where Jesus reveals what our relationship is, is that it's not that he's trying to keep the mystery from everyone. It's that he wants anyone who wants the mystery revealed to them to draw closer. And this sort of helps us understand the whole Son of God mystery, the secret of Mark, is we don't get to find out that Jesus is the Son of God and what that fully means unless we stick around until the very end. Now we know why Jesus told his disciples not to tell anyone about his divine status until after he'd been raised from the dead. Because he didn't want anyone to confuse it. He didn't want anyone to miss how his divinity was revealed by his willingness to go to a cross. And remember our programmatic statement in Mark, Jesus came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He could not compromise. Don't miss the giving his life as a ransom for many. Don't get sidetracked by Jesus' healing or Jesus' teaching or Jesus turning one loaf of bread into hundreds. Make sure that you stick around long enough. If you want to really find out who this Messiah is, you have to read to the end. You have to stay when the crowds are gone. In other words, it's asking disciples of Jesus, like these disciples in the story and like you and me, to go a little deeper and to come a little bit closer. And then Mark finishes it by telling us, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but explained everything in private to his disciples. And as we just saw in the previous passage, Jesus' disciples were whomever chose to stay, whoever read to the end, whoever stuck by a little bit longer. Jesus wanted them to want it, to desire this. And so he says, to you has been given the secret, not just that you understand it, but that you guard the secret now as your own, that you also understand that Jesus being the Son of God means that he is the crucified Son of God, and that that means something for us as his disciples, that our lives and our fellowship also take that same shape. It's a good question for us to ask as the church in the world today when, they, when the world sees the church, do they see the shape of a crucified God? Do they see our life and our fellowship and our ministry take the same shape as Jesus? And I think that's always the question and the reason that Mark wants to keep Jesus' identity a secret because it's so specific and it is absolutely the essential part of who he is. And so it's worth going deeper for in order to gain insight into it. Now, what's interesting is when Jesus is explaining his use of the parable, he actually makes a quotation from the prophet Isaiah when he says, um, I speak in parables so that they may indeed look but not perceive and may listen but not understand, so they may not turn again and be forgiven. Well, if we read the prophet Isaiah, when God gives this word to the prophet and says, and this is a quote from Isaiah, go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but don't understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. 
And so we wonder, is this a doomed mission that God sends Isaiah on? And by that same token, is it a doomed mission that Jesus sends his disciples on or that Jesus is sent on by God also? Why are people meant to see but not understand? Well, they're meant to see Jesus, but they don't understand who he is because they haven't seen everything he's going to do. Indeed, the most important thing, the essential thing that he is going to do. And it's only after Jesus has been crucified and then has been raised from the dead that people will begin to understand what they were seeing before. A reason that I also like looking at Jesus quoting Isaiah through Isaiah's lens is that this isn't all Isaiah was told to say. Because Isaiah, just like you and me, is listening to this and thinks, that seems really depressing. (laughs) It seems really sad and frustrating that you want me to tell people about this, but that they won't understand until later. And so Isaiah asked the question that we as humans always ask, that we are so drawn to. Isaiah says, how long, O Lord? So if they're going to see but not understand and they're going to hear but not comprehend, how long? How long will it be like this? When will be the moment that people will finally put their seeing and their understanding together? And it says that God answers Isaiah, until the cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. God answers Isaiah and says, you'll know that things are about to get better, that people are about to understand once the land has been emptied. Isaiah is forecasting, is is warning Israel that it's about to go into exile. It's going to be taken from its homeland and the peoples will be scattered. That's what all of this business about hearing and understanding. Isaiah is going to proclaim this, but it's not going to change anything. The people won't listen. And so when he says, how long, O Lord, will it be like this? Will the people not get it and not connect what they're hearing with what they're seeing and what they're understanding? And so God says, until it's happened, until the worst thing that could happen happens, They'll see that the land is empty and that there are houses with no people living in it until everything is desolate and the weeds grow up and the Lord is far away and everyone is far away and everything seems empty and forsaken. And although that sounds bad, although that sounds depressing, God's actually saying once that moment arrives where you've hit rock bottom, that's how you'll know you're on your way up. That's when you'll have the perspective to be able to truly see and to truly understand. And of course, we see this in Mark's gospel as well. Because we don't see who Jesus really is until we finally arrive at such devastation. This is how Mark describes Jesus' last moments on the cross. When it was noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Finally, devastation. Interesting. Do you notice how much this sounds like the description that God gave Isaiah? When will people finally see and understand? And God said, when it's become empty, when the land is desolate, when everyone is gone. And what is it that Jesus cries out in the midst of darkness that covers the whole land? God, why have you forsaken me? You don't seem to be here. Everything is desolate. And it's at that moment on the cross 
when the centurion notices what happens and says, This was God's son. Indeed, it's just like Jesus the prophet and just like Isaiah the prophet foretold. You won't be able to see exactly what's going on and understand it until this moment of devastation has arrived. And in Mark's gospel, that happens just as Mark seamlessly brings in Isaiah to tell us that it will happen. Once we see him on the cross, we truly see him. And once we see Jesus on the cross as the Son of God, we truly see ourselves as the community of faith and truly understand what shape we are meant to take in the world. Places that are dark invite us to go. Places that seem desolate invite us to go. Places that seem forsaken and people who seem empty and alone also call out to us. These are the places that we can go and the places where we will begin to see what it means to be followers of a crucified Messiah. Thank you so much for joining me this week and I look forward to seeing you next week as well. Well, grace and peace, uh, beloved friends, and welcome to uh, Your Week with St. Luke's, our weekly podcast uh, where we're in uh, the book of Mark, and we're taking it one chapter at a time, and we're blessed to have all four St. Luke's pastors here again with the Reverend Dr. E.B. Arnold. Um, and so we here we are in, in chapter four, the secret sign of God, this Jesus, the storyteller. So uh, let's get into it. All right. Well, one of the hallmarks of Mark's gospel is this secrecy motif. Uh, he wants to keep the fact that Jesus is son of God under wraps until we see Jesus on the cross, because that is the, the defining feature of Jesus as the son of God. And so it can't ever be separate from him. And so Mark actually weaves the secrecy motif throughout the story, even in other ways, just so that it really reinforces that um, there's a lot of mystery uh, a lot of secrecy around who this Jesus is. And one of the ways that he does this is introduces Jesus' teaching in parables. And of course, here in chapter four, we get the famous parable of the sower. Uh, Jesus tells this parable about a sower goes out to sow and he scatters the seed and it falls on different types of soil and it gets different results. And then of course, later his disciples ask him, what does this mean? <laughs> and uh, he actually says the reason he's teaching in parables is to keep certain things a mystery. Um, what do we think about that? Like, does this seem like Jesus is trying to like keep like the good news for himself or to keep it from some people? Why would you want uh, the word of God, that, that the thing that the sower scatters, to remain a mystery? So I'll just, I'll just name that this is the opposite of everything I was told in church growing up, right? <laughs> Talk about it as much as you can. You need to tell all your friends about Jesus. You need to tell them who he is. Tell them all the stories. So to see Jesus going, let's let's just keep this quiet who I really am, um, goes against maybe some of what we've heard in the way that we've been taught what Christianity is about. So I think there's an initial sort of rub there. Is it... <coughs> Is it because he doesn't want to give one answer? Is it is it because he wants to be a storyteller where in narrative we all find our own answers? We all find our own understanding and we all find our own understanding at different times at different places. And and so is it is it the mystery that 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 there is no one singular answer to his parables that we're supposed to get from it, but it's multiple things. And that if we say there's only one answer, we've kind of, we, we, we sort of miss the mystery of God. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the beauties of parables is that there's, mm -hmm. there's so many options. There's so mm -hmm. many, and we can be in different emotions like last week and, and, and read it and, and this comes up and I hear God speaking and challenge me this way. And, and I mean, I think that's, that's part of the beauty of, of Jesus' teaching in that way is it leaves so many options available to us because we're created so differently and so uniquely with different mm -hmm. gifts and experiences and backgrounds. So I, I love that idea that it keeps, it keeps the options open for how we can experience and be a part of the kingdom of God. Mm. 
Yeah, and I, I think that what's really interesting is that if we look at it that way, then Jesus's entire story in Mark is itself a parable, mm. you know, which mm. is really interesting um, because all of us will identify at different times and places with different aspects of the story. Uh, and sometimes, uh, because we have four Gospels, I'll find myself gravitating to a different Gospel at different times. So yes. sometimes mm. it's not even a parable for me right now. Right, right, right. <laughs> but the, that's the, the beautiful thing. And when I think about the, the, the parabola, you know, the figure, it's infinite. It keeps coming back around. Mm. Um, and so I love that idea of, it's never meant to have one fixed interpretation because then it wouldn't be a parable anymore. <laughs> and then with, with secret, there's also a revealing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also like, like I have, I have seen and discovered, experienced, read, heard this. There's a revealing that that sometimes can happen if we understand it in that secret, uh, hidden uh, way in space that that makes it more exciting. I think it also draws us back to the text to read mm-hmm. again and read in new ways. All right, there's gravitas to be built, mm. yes. so that when it hits, it actually impacts you and changes and changes you. I'm always going to go to the literary function of things too, and when you have this third person narrator who is telling you, you we readers know something that the people in the story may or may not know. Mm-hmm. Um, there is there the the secret is exciting and it makes you want to read more to go, ooh, what's he going to do next? Uh, do, are they going to realize? Like, is he going to get found out? And it's not the best literary secret because he gets found out throughout the whole thing. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it is it is enticing. Like, the idea of secrecy makes you want to hear more and you want to then find out at the end what, why exactly did he want it to be a secret when he's doing all of these public things? And you've kind of shared that already, E.B., of, of, no, 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 it's not, the secret's not about the things I'm doing. The secret is about who I am, and it's because I don't want you to miss the big picture. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what's, what's so great and so evident, too, in the parable of the sower. Because we think that the, we think that the emphasis is supposed to be on the parable, right? And it's who understands it and who doesn't. Well, the answer is actually really clear, but that was never really the point. The point was, and I love this part, after he's done teaching the parable, it says, when he was alone, Mm -hmm. those who were around him, along with the 12 disciples, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret. The secret is who stayed around afterwards to ask him about it. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Who gets the, the rest of the story? Those who are patient and willing to follow Jesus and stay after the crowds die off, who are willing to wait until Jesus is done eating his supper, who are willing to follow along to get everything. Yeah. To, to, to be curious, to investigate, yes, to, to be ask curious. more questions, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's so much, uh, so powerful. It's not the people who hear, oh, he said that? Great, all right. It, it's not It's not just hearing and, mm-hmm. and just going, okay, those were the words, done. Right. You know, Jesus said it, that settles it kind of, mm-hmm. of thing. It's the who, who had more hunger, who yes. was continually hungry and continually knowing there was more to be. To be right. gleaned. It makes well, me think. Of, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. I was just saying. It makes me think of undergrad. Uh, like the the ways that my religion and philosophy professors, uh, or the conversations that I had with them that actually changed my life, happened in their office after mm-hmm. class. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. a hunger and a thirst to like. No, I didn't understand that. Can you explain it again? Which led to them asking me questions like, Jeremy, what happens if we actually respect everybody's personhood mm-hmm. off yeah. the clock? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, it just reminds mm-hmm. me of that. What were you saying? Yeah. Well, I think it, I, I've been thinking of the word secretive. You, you said there's a, let me tell you a secret. It's something that nobody else knows and nobody's supposed to know. And then there's, then there's an understanding of, um, I'm some, I'm a secretive person. Like I, I keep things to myself. I let it ruminate in me and mm. grow in me. And is there something in that where, mm-hmm. where, you know, he tells again, he tells the, the demons and the unclean to keep it to yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and is there something in that, that Jesus is saying, it's not just about not telling anybody else, but it's like, 
what does it mean to keep it to yourself and let it ruminate and grow and find its place and its root in you? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just mm-hmm. a different way to think mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. Don't, don't scatter until you've grown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. And right. that mm. demonstrates that you actually understood the that maybe not the meaning of the parable, but that it was meaningful. Right. Like the, the fact that you're willing to stew on it, the fact that you're willing to think on it means that you already have believed that there's something important there to find. And that, I think, is one of the most pivotal things that we can do is believe that there's something there to find. Mm -hmm. Um, I tell this to my husband every time he cannot find something, which is every time he goes to look for something. And I said, (laughs) do you know why I can find things? Because I believe they're there. Mm. Okay. <laughs> if you go to the, you know, the refrigerator believing that it's not there or not fully believing that it's there, you won't find it. <laughs> you know, but I believe it's there and I keep looking until I get it. Mm. And so these people, they listened to the parable. They waited for the teaching and then they thought, like you said, I got to I got to think more about this. Mm-hmm. I I got questions. I, they internalize it and those are the people that they grab onto Jesus. They're like, mm-hmm. I need to stay with you longer until I figure this out. I need to ask more questions. I need to understand better. But I think it's really that willingness to, um, to like you said, to sit with it as long as you need to and not just, mm-hmm. oh, I got what I need and now I'm going to go run with it. Right. But I'm really going to marinate in it. Yeah. And it's less of a regurgitated faith. Like, I just repeat everything I was told. Mm-hmm. It's well, more that, of like I found my words that circle around this thing that transformed. That's my what life. happens when you pick up the seeds off the path and then you pass those along. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm I'm now like my mind is going crazy with this metaphor yeah. of mm-hmm. uh, this, with this parable of where the seeds fall is 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 we want to pass on faith that is, is has been processed more than just passing on the exact things we've been taught. Um, so it's it's what yeah. you're talking about. It's yeah. it's not regurgitating. It's not picking up seeds off the path and passing them to the next generation. Right. Right. It's letting them take live root. within you, take yeah. root, and, and then you produce different seeds. Correct. Yes. From, the different same, fruit, right? from the same, yeah, right. from the same uh, source. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't mm-hmm. change the, what are, uh, there's probably gardening terms for all of this. <laughs> um, I, I always struggle with the, the, the gardening metaphors because I don't have the patience for it. So there we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, and is it something that also allows this idea, this first, this is the first parable he, that he tells in Mark, this idea that God is still telling stories, that Jesus is still writing stories, mm-hmm. that there are still seeds that are being planted, mm-hmm. and that if we sit with our experiences and sit with our moments, there is something of the kingdom that is there. And so often we run through our life and we go, oh, I just want to forget about that or I don't mm-hmm. want to deal with that or, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or I was bad in that moment. Like I totally reacted poorly, emotionally reactive, <laughs> you know, week, yeah. from last week. Um, is there something where Jesus is saying with this parable, there are going to be stories I'm going to teach you to sit with the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. They're not just found in this particular gospel. I am continually telling Telling you stories and planting seeds, mm-hmm. and you have to sit with those to see the kingdom of God. Well, and Jen, I'll say, having been with you the last few years and sitting with you learning to preach Easter mm-hmm. and figuring out how to preach Easter, yes, I I feel like every year you look at me and go, I've preached this before. I've done <laughs> like I have been doing this for twenty some years. I don't have anything else to say about it. Mm-hmm. And every time. You do. (laughs) Every time there is something new to say about it. There is something that as it has worked in you, as it has worked in our community, as it has worked in us, there is still something to be said. There are still new stories to be told that come from these stories. It's not exactly. They they still come Mm -hmm. from these Mm -hmm. stories, but there are new ways to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And, And that's exactly it. It's willingness to fall in love with that process. Yeah. of constantly revisiting because what's really interesting mm. is Jesus says to his followers if you don't understand this parable 
how will you understand all the parables? Right. Like that that is the key to understanding them is not to figure out what does this mean or what does this correspond with? Who's the good soil? Who's the bad soil? <laughs> right, right, which we do. But exactly. Mm-hmm. All yep. the yep. time. But, That's how we exegete but that But the passage. fact that the people who came and sat with him longer and asked him more and probed him further, he said, if you don't understand how to interact with this parable, you won't get any of the rest of them. And so I think he's really saying, make peace with the process. Yeah. You know? yeah. Embrace the fact that you will constantly come back to this over mm-hmm. and over and you will learn something new every time. And sometimes you will even learn that the thing you learned last time wasn't the thing you were supposed to learn. And that's the <laughs> whole point. <laughs> exactly. Well, in, in the next parable, he said, uh, is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed or uh, or not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, mm-hmm. nor is anything secret except to come to light. Right, yes. and so like, yeah, this this first one he's setting up because then it's a parable after parable after parable after parable, right? And so you got to get this one first, then sit with it, ruminate with it, understand what this is for you, put your words, your experience around this great, great truth. And then you're a lamp on a hill, keep, you're all these things. Keep going, because it says, for to those mm-hmm. who have, more will be given. Yes. Uh, right? Right. 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 <laughs> and <laughs> from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I, or what they think they have. Yeah. 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 Because, yeah, because how, how many conversations <laughs> have we, yeah. we had with people who said, I thought I had it figured out. Mm-hmm. 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 And now I feel like I have nothing. Mm-hmm. 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 Thinking about the messianic secret in, in Mark and thinking about at Jesus' death, uh, the soldier going, uh, truly, this is the son of God. I always like to think that somebody was like, we know! You know what I mean? <laughs> but then, you finally got here. But, but then I also... It. Yeah, no, of course not. Nobody did. No, of course not. But I'm, what I'm saying is, though, I wonder it. if, I wonder if, though, for those who did take the time to uh, go a little farther and ask questions, if it was a little less surprising. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's all. Well, because, I mean, it's true. At the beginning, we're told, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Oh, whoops, he said it. (laughs) But then... Secrets out. (laughs) Gospel's over. But then it's almost like, all right, we all know this, but we're going to play dumb. You know, we're going to suspend disbelief, Mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. And so we know it's going to be revealed, and so we're waiting to see what's the trigger. What's the thing that reveals it? What's the thing that that finally gets it? And in in the parable of the sower, it's people drawing closer. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that reveals the secret of the parable. Of course, in Mark, the thing that reveals the secret of who Jesus is, like you said, the centurion, is the fact that Jesus is on the cross, yeah. that he is the crucified Messiah. And now the cat's out of the bag. We, mm-hmm. we know now, oh, that's what makes him the son of God. Mm-hmm. He's the crucified one. And the only way we'll understand that secret is to draw closer to it mm-hmm. and, and to, to draw closer to the, the cross. Story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so many of us want to skip from not even Holy Thursday, but Palm Sunday to Easter. We don't want to draw close to the cross. And so we don't want to know this Jesus. That's what, that's honestly, I believe what we're saying Mm -hmm. is we don't want to know this. We don't want to know this secret um, because this secret means sacrifice. The secret means death, Mm -hmm. dying to self, dying to some of the things. And this is a tough Jesus to know. Um, But the only way to understand the secret is to draw close to the cross. Mm -hmm. And in, in a really interesting way... And playing on the words, we're asked to keep the secret. Mm-hmm. Can not just keep it like keep it to ourselves, but can you hold this hold secret mm-hmm. close to you? Mm-hmm. Can you move through life holding this notion of to be a child of God through Jesus Christ means that I too will conform to the shape of this cross. Mm-hmm. You know, so in, in some sense, we keep this messianic secret close to us and close to our identity. And a lot of people don't want to keep a secret that's that big. Yeah. <laughs> that's a big, big, dark secret to hold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so next week, we're going to come back and talk about what kind of Jesus next week is it we got <laughs> here? Uh, it's uh, Jesus, the the healer, right? Liberation. So what does it mean to be liberated mm-hmm. and find that secret and drawing close to the cross liberating? Because mm-hmm. that's not always, again, how we think of liberation and think of healing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet in markets that way. So come back next week. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.